Welcome to the Sheila Mack Show, reality at its finest. Here we have real people sharing real stories and actionable steps to help you reinvent, rebuild, and reboot your business and personal life on your terms. I'm your host, Sheila Mack, and today we have special guest, Golnoosh Hak- Hakim Devar. Now, she is the associate professor, doctorate, and law founder who is public also a published author and senior international development expert with specialization in rule of law programs in Asia, Africa, and MENA countries, fluent in three languages, and she has led the strategic planning and implementation of capacity building programs in South Asia and Africa, an expert project manager skilled in design, implementation, and evaluation of development projects, an executive in online educational programs, and senior rule of law expert professor of global law and policy, policy evaluation research, and qualitative quantitative methodology, able to teach high technical classes and bridge the gap between the academic world and actual practice. Publications are focused on law and policy development, gender-based violence, economic sanctions, the United Nations, and peace building, something we all need so much of these days. So some of the countries she's worked is Kosovo, Afghanistan, Iran, Yemen, Libya, Sudan, and, and the list goes on and on. So she has worked with fair trial standards implementation and also gender-based violence mixed method evaluation and human rights mixed method evaluation, other rule of law and other rule of law mixed method evaluations. Wow, that sounds like a lot of work and a a real mission and calling. I I love that. So welcome to the show, Golnoosh. Thank you. And, this show was actually brought about based on my new best-selling book, Bootstraps and Bra Straps, the formula to go from rock bottom back into action in any situation. And this last almost two years now, it seems, we've had just about every situation imaginable hit us all globally at once. So you, um, if you have a story um, about your business or personal life where you experienced um, a difficult situation and how you got back on track, I love to start with that. Thank you so much, Sheila, for having me on the show. Um, and thanks for that uh, bio that uh, that uh, you provided about my life. Um, so I'll be honest, the reason I went into the field that I went into, which is a focus on human rights and, and uh, bringing about justice in the world in, in some way, shape or form, I'm not sure how successful I can be, but I hope that I can leave something behind as, uh, as I get older and I uh, get closer to to the end, but I really went into this field because um, I was working uh, before. I was working in in manufacturing, and I uh, loved my job. I loved everybody I worked with, but there came a time that I realized that there was there was a lot of injustice around me. There were a lot of individuals that were harmed. There were um, over 80, 80 million uh, people that were forcefully, forcefully displaced from their homes and were living in in camps, in uh, displacement camps, either their own, in their own countries or outside of their own countries. Um, and uh, there were individuals who were killed and were buried in mass graves. And in Kosovo, as an example, is a place where um, there were over 1 million people who were displaced. And and so reading about all of this and reading about all the injustice, about women who experience injustice, who experience violence, you know, 30% of the women in the world, um, even today, experience some form of injustice and and gender-based violence. And and I remember coming to the office and thinking, I opened, turned on my computer, and I don't know if you uh, remember before when we had this desktop, and everybody uses a laptop now. I pressed the button and I looked at the little happy face. To me, it looked like a little happy face. I pressed the on button and, and I looked at it turn on and make the, you know, kind of coming on sound. And I thought, what am I doing? I need to do be, I need to be doing something more. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that was kind of the turning moment in my life. That's when I decided that I needed to change the direction of my life. And I didn't want to care about, of course, every profession is important, but for me, it was important to do something 
that um, I could hopefully in a small way um, contribute to the injustice that um, to alleviate the injustice that exists in the world. Yeah. Mm, wow. That was a, a huge reboot in your life, <laughs> pressing that button. <laughs> That's great. Very true. <laughs> yes. And things like that are definitely a calling or a guided something, something beyond us guiding you to do that. And, and it's small efforts. If you're tuning in and you're frustrated with the way things are right now on this planet, it's the grassroots efforts. It's the community efforts that make the most difference globally, actually. They can actually show up globally. And it starts just with each person taking action and not just standing by the sidelines, staying quiet about it. So that's that's what it's going to take, I think. Yeah, it's so true, Sheila. I want to actually pick up on what you just said and that every individual matters, right? Every citizen matters. And that's the um, approach that I take towards, you know, when we talk about rule of law, it sounds very big. It sounds kind of like this, this big thing about law and it's for the lawyers, but it's actually not. It's for people. Mm -hmm. It's for people to understand their rights. You know, most people in the world that are experiencing uh, injustice, um, they don't even know that that's injustice. They think that it's bad luck, right? In, in the U.S., we are fortunate because we have shows like Law and & Order and, uh, you know, the CSI, and that we understand a lot more about the justice structure, what our rights are, um, the fact that we do have rights. But that's not the fact in all places in the world. Um, there are places where the definition of gender-based violence is not even clear. What does it mean? Women um, who are forced into marriage, they don't recognize that as forced marriage because that's what they're used to, because that's, um, you know, culture plays a big role as a part of our life. Mm -hmm. And there, there are good parts of every culture and there are parts that can be improved. And, um, and that exists in the world. We need to recognize that, that, that we need to move forward. We need to look at individuals, look at individuals and how they're experiencing their lives, how they're experiencing a justice structure based on that culture that they are living in and they're growing in. Um, I have this example that I always use, um, especially with my students, is that the world is like a body, a full body, a human body, but it's made up of all these different organs, right? So we have arms and hands and, and uh, legs and feet, and all of them have to work together, right? All the organs. And those are all the institutions that work together. So our, our toes and, and our, um, our brain has to tell our, our fingers to move, my fingers to move, or our mouth to talk. Um, but... Uh, if one but if one of these institutions is one of these organs stops working, the everything falls apart, right? There's pain and you have to hold your hand up if it's broken. But at the center of it are the cells and those cells are the individual human. I mean, I would I would compare them to the individual human beings, individual citizens, the grassroots that you mentioned. Every single human in, uh, being needs to know their rights, needs to have those rights, needs to live free, uh, needs to be able to have um, dignity, um, liberty, right? Not have, not to be detained arbitrarily. Uh, so that's really something that is important and I think is very important for all of us, um, at least from my perspective to, to take into consideration and hopefully in some way bring equality, bring everybody on the same playing field. So you're absolutely right. The, the grassroots, the individual is really important. Mm, yes, yes, yeah. very much. And so during this time, we have worldwide, we have people that are so upset because these laws are not being upheld in a fair and equal way. Mm -hmm. And it's something that has caused a breakdown right now in many ways as we rebuild hopefully to something more fair and equitable for all and until that point what what do you suggest with with all your studies and actions um what do you suggest that people do you know grassroots way to really take action in a positive way to to start getting the change we really need so that's a very important question and, an, and a difficult question because we have to come at it from many different angles. Mm -hmm. um, 
when when I talk about my work in rule of law, right? Rule of law is about checks and balances, and that checks and balances comes from institutions that are held responsible to the to the citizens and citizens who know, understand, and actively hold their institutions responsible. Yeah. Um, so that's a very important component of balance that needs to be created in rule of law work in creating um, a, a system that that works for the citizens. So what can the citizens do? I mean, um, I think we are fortunate today because we have access to uh, social media. We have access. We can all be independent activists, journalists, um, researchers, right? Everybody has access. We. There was a time where in order to research a topic, you had to actually go to a library. You had to hope that there was a library in your town, go to the library, borrow books, read them. Well, at first know how to read and then read them and then understand. But now we have, we, we do have a lot of information at our fingertips. Um, so what I think is really beautiful are the young people who are extremely active, who take a cause and run with it, yeah. who take a cause and make it their own. And, and really, and I mean that in every country, but really take that and, <laughs> bring attention to it because sitting here, um, I'm in Washington, D.C., sitting in Washington, D.C., I don't know what's going on in many other places, in many other countries, except through those channels, those streams of information that, that are coming out. When um, when things were, when when the turmoil happened, started to happen in Myanmar in, in, um, uh, recently, uh, within the last year, um, which is a place where I worked in, I was so happy to see the youth were taking to the streets, that they were active on social media, that they were posting information about what is happening. Because unless we know from outside, we are working in mm -hmm. complete darkness, right? Um, or semi-darkness, or we are going based on speculation. So um, I do think that that's very important. And I think for... Uh, for all of us, for whoever is not in the center of uh, the epidemic, that the, what is going, you know, what is what is really affecting that that, that country or local situation, it's we need to support these these young voices and these activists who are um, who are bringing attention to to their cause. So I, I do think that the individuals matter, the citizens matter, and, and youth are so important in, in ensuring a future that is more just than it was yesterday. I mean, we're not going to have full justice, but we can be, we can bring in a little bit more, we can get a little closer to, to equality, we can get a little closer to justice. Mm. I think that's that's really key. Yes. And, you know, you don't have to know what you're doing to start. <laughs> I, I remember getting involved. I have six children. I adopted three, three mm -hmm. of my own, and they did not get fair and equal education in the public system. Mm -hmm. And I actually pulled them out at a certain point. But I said, this isn't right. It's, it's based on your zip code. It's based on finances here in the U.S. It really is different um, than what we would hope it to be. And mm -hmm. I started campaigning um, nonpartisan and just getting involved. And I was really guided to do that. Over the years, a lot of the laws were changed uh, um, in, in various states that I helped in um, based on, you know, if a child's bullied, they're able mm -hmm. to now have an opportunity transfer or if something's going wrong. And many of the charter schools that were opened in the, the most at-risk areas um, are the highest performing schools that outperform the top the top area schools, whatever the top financial area schools, because they there was this freedom given and it made it better. Not as good as we need it to be by any means. Right. Not at all. And I remember being in a documentary and saying, you know, it's the one child that we deny that is going to have the cure to some cancer or some disease or, or your disease. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that you denied. And so when we deny one child, we're denying everyone. Right. You know, and, and so that was something that was, I think, probably... 92 somewhere 1992 that far back <laughs> that yeah. we did the documentary but that was that i didn't know what i was doing i just things would show up and people that cared would get involved and 
And so that's it. Just start. That makes a big difference. And then you start to work with people that know more about what to do. Oh, we need to petition. We need to do this and that and the law. But the more you know about the law, the easier it is. And I think that's important. Just the education part mm -hmm. is, is going to make a big difference. You're, you're so right. And, and you know, and, um, just wanted to pick up on a couple of points that, that you mentioned once. One is congratulations on, on having uh, your, your kids and being able to provide you know, that support for them and teaching them really from, from their own experience. You know, you see something wrong and let's, let's try to figure out how to, how to manage it, how to fix it for uh, your kids and for others. Um, and, and that really makes me think about this, that there is nothing that is too small. There is no mission that is too small. There is no cause that is too small because every cause is affecting someone. Every Everything that we're looking at has an impact on one or another individual. So there is, uh, if we see something around that is not, and I, I guess this is kind of a call to action for anybody who, uh, who wants to, or who is interested is if you see something that is affecting you, you see something that is making you think, wow, this, I am feeling really sad with this. I'm really feeling that this needs to change. Then you can, you can, you can be the one, you can change it. You can be the one to take action. And I think that's really important. Um, at least, um, you know, it, around us at, in the US, we see a lot of problems as well. We see problems with homelessness we see problems in education. We see problems with, with drug abuse and the number of issues are, are very large. So, um, and, and I think that that's something that everyone should not just pass by don't pass by an issue stop and think about it is this your cause if not that's okay you know there hopefully there'll be the next person who will take on that cause but maybe everyone should think it's very fulfilling if we find a cause and we fight for it mm -hmm. um for me it's been on, on personal level it's been very uh, it was very difficult before i had a cause and i searched desperately to have a cause i kept on thinking whose cause am i taking on who and i would ask my friends well what is your cause what are you living living for what is the thing that you want to do and leave behind and um you know everybody had different ideas and i would think about it i'm like well that's not really that's not me um so it, it does take time to identify that cause but it makes a big difference in in our mundane life in our daily life that is just you know we get into this routine but if you have that in that additional cause you're like looking forward to it you're looking forward to wow i changed one person's life right. that's that's great i have made a difference beyond uh, my own life and and for me it's definitely been uh something that i've looked for when we go back to the discussion of of peace um you know peace is a really big topic and a lot of times that's not even defined what is peace is it like lack of war is it when we don't have war we have peace or is it when we have justice we have peace or is it when we have justice for everybody equally we have peace you know it's it's very very mm -hmm. difficult to really pinpoint and narrow down and define peace but overall i think one way we can look at it is putting the citizens putting individuals first that's where we can think about and, and really rationalize and think about peace in this way that is a little bit more digestible, right? It's something that we can work with. Um, of course, there are other issues with the environment, and but but we individuals do matter, right? Individuals uh, can make a difference and can affect and even can create that definition of peace long term. Hey, a hundred years from now, that one child that you were talking about, that one child who could have possibly been left behind could be the one um, who is defining peace for us, who is going to write the next um, charter that's going to define fully what peace should be, uh, how peace should be defined in the, uh, in the world. Uh, or that child who is, you know, in a refugee camp and is not getting proper education because there was war in his or her country and, and um, he had to escape with his parents and um, doesn't receive proper education, doesn't receive proper food or clothing. I mean, that child could be the one that is um, making that that leap for us. So, yeah. so providing support, you know, on, on all levels, it's, it's just so important. And I don't know why i you know i have i have been quite fortunate for myself in my own life i've, I've uh, lived a um, 
pretty straightforward life. I, I don't know why the world is like this, the way that it is, why some people are um, in the positions that there are and then they're facing more injustice. They are born in, in areas that there is more injustice, but but I don't know if it's even important for me to know why. Maybe it's more important for me to understand what can I do uh, to make a change, to make a difference, and um, to make uh, help people understand that they have rights, that there is such a thing as justice and injustice, and that it's not just bad luck that they're living in. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, now this show actually, um, and my book, came about to give people resources and help. And when I did that, I had, my goal was how can I get the most resources to as many people as possible? So every time I interview someone, I know there's someone out there needs to hear your message. Mm -hmm. And over, over time, there's also been people that introduce me to things. So one of the things I like to share on the show is, and I don't get paid for this. (laughs) This is something that's from my heart that's going to help People in the United States and Canada at this point, there is something called 211. Mm-hmm. And so if you are a parent and you your children go to a physical school, get the school to post about 211. Now, if you Google 211 in your state or province in Canada, you will see a list that helps people, whether it's seniors, veterans, getting food on the table, helping with mortgages, with with this COVID situation, getting out of abusive situations, helping with addictions, mental health resources, so many resources that people, this is created nationwide and all in Canada as well, and people are not aware of it. So even if all you do is post a piece of paper about this or share this with somebody you know that's that's down on their luck, oh, and may, you know, a lot of times you might be working with people you don't know what's going on at home, mm-hmm. and just to be able to have them see or get that, they can get to a resource that could save a life. You know, they have suicide prevention hotlines, but it's all in one place. And a lot of times when one thing is wrong in your life or in in, in a family, a home for a person, everything, finances are wrong and health is wrong. You know, everything is affected. So to be able to just share simple resources like that and get your kids involved ask them to po- post it to the parents, to the teachers and different things like that can make a huge difference in one person's life that makes a difference in other people's lives that we may never know. Yeah. But but that's that's just the goal and and part of the show I always share about the 211. So it's so simple and everybody I, I think about 70% of the people I talk to have never heard of it. Yeah. Mhm that's uh that's a great resource and then i appreciate you um sharing that and um you know there is a park near my house Mm -hmm. and every day when i in the mornings when i take my dog for a walk i see people lining up um for for food it's Mm -hmm. uh, and then volunteers come out and they bring out bags of food um with water and fruit and things that people you know should should really have but they don't have access to and it's just incredible the line has been increasing over this period that we've had COVID Uh. and every day I saw this line get longer longer and longer and longer so um, it's wonderful to know that there are such resources out there Uh wonderful to realize that individuals like yourself and then many many others are posting and are are, um, donating and are providing this assistance for uh, you know for something so simple as fruit and water that's something that people need for daily nutrition Um, Mm -hmm. so that's definitely a a wonderful resource to to know, right? The two one one and and have everybody chiming in and and posting the different resources in their cities. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes. Now I'd love to hear more about some of the programs you've worked on. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. So I have done a, a variety of things, um, as as uh, you read um, in my bio as well i've been in many different countries and working with um with universities and with uh, students uh with prosecutors at times so really different programming um in 
in my time that I was in, in Afghanistan, I worked with um, uh, with a lot of university students, so teaching them about law, um, in particular international law, and um, making sure that there was uh, an equal balance in mm -hmm. the academic world between men and women. Yeah. So that women were also coming in and and um, you know, joining university programs and uh, in particular in particular studying law because um, I do think that. Uh, law is extremely important in individuals' lives. It, it creates, it's kind of the base of that, creating that, that checks and balances that I was um, talking about. So, uh, so that's one of the things that was very near to my heart um, and ensuring that women had equal representation, not only at, um, as students, as faculty, uh, and the judiciary. Uh, this is something that I'm quite worried about as we see the shift in Afghanistan and, and there may be a, uh, the, the same women may not have the accesses that they had uh, when, when I went there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm afraid that maybe women will not be able to actually be judges any longer as mm -hmm. it was uh, before 2003. Um, and, and so their lives may be at risk. So those you know, these are things that I kind of daily think about, and and it's it's quite um, uh, it, it it makes me very anxious because I'm I'm so concerned about the same individuals that I worked with. Mm -hmm. um, that was one thing. I in in Myanmar, I worked with the prosecutors, as I mentioned, training them on fair trial standards. What are fair trials? What does it mean for individuals of all backgrounds to have? Uh, their voices heard equally. And these are prosecutors, right? So they're hearing cases. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and it, it's really important for them to understand international law, the international, the base of international law on what fair trial is and what equality means in, in, in fair trial. So, um, you know, when, when I talked about a uni, you know, uniform base for everybody to be equal, that means that anyone no matter what their religion is when they are in front of the law they should be treated the same so sometimes that means providing assistance right so an individual who can, you may have two individuals come in but one may be uh, not speaking the the language of the court so providing them interpretation right of, of yeah. what is the right providing them that assistance someone may come in and they are uh, blind Right, a blind person coming to court, they can't see. They, they are reacting and they're acting very differently than another person who is able, who has sight. So, providing that individual with maximum possible assistance, so they are treated equally, that they're they have equal um, uh, representation, uh, not only on the legal side but also on their um, their position, their uh, their situation being equal with the other. So um, fair trial is really, I'm kind of breaking it down to really the, the basics, but that was one of the other things that I did. I, I did a training on this um, and um, unfortunately all the countries I've worked with have ended up in not necessarily um, moving towards democratic positions, but uh, I'm hoping that, that long term the, some of these trainings have uh, have been solidified in the minds of the people that I worked with. Mm -hmm. um, well, other than that, of course, I've, I've taught at, at universities. I've taught, and you know, you mentioned law and policy. So um, I love teaching and my students, and that's that's another service I think that uh, that we provide um, to to our to the future. Right, and the students are the future, and and. Uh, maybe framing the minds of the, the students is a way of um, framing their minds to think openly, to not think one dimensionally, to not think only um, in their small circle, but go beyond that and see that there is more to the world, to law, to policy, to action beyond what they are exposed to, um, maybe in a, you know at, at their kind of before coming into the program. So I really uh, push on that, push on bringing in an international perspective so uh, that we see we are actually, in a lot of ways, very fortunate here, right? Um, and, and I think seeing what is happening in other places makes us think about our position, our lives, mm -hmm. our 
structure. And that will push, push us towards improving even more, right? What are the things that are working? What are the things that we can improve? Mm -hmm. um, so always having that international aspect, of course, um, helps. Um, I, I came to the U.S. when I was 13. So for me, this is all, it was all new. I, I learned English as a, as a 13 year old. So, wow. so it was an experience for myself to integrate into this, uh, into this new world. Um, and, and I saw, I always see that, that difference. Oh, okay. This was an experience I had before. This is a new experience. So I think it's good for everyone to be able to see that for all my students to be able to see that, uh, multi uh, multi perspective in the work that they do yes yes that's beautiful it's something i didn't travel until later in life and i was born and raised in um, california um, in the foothills so la Cunada, montrose glendale california was kind of my home base and for me i had people from all over the planet as neighbors and right. friends and I can remember being raised partially by grandparents at one point when my parents were sick, that they had, my grandmother had all these older women that were probably 75, 80 back then, and I'm five, and they would sit and have tea uh, and talk. And they would have these discussions about where they came from on the planet and what they went through. It was their adventure, their story, their reality, and it was living history for me. They were these beautiful feminine stoic women now back then they were running businesses that maybe the husband passed away or something happened mm -hmm. and they were running businesses when even in the u.s that was like a woman can't run a business and they had to deal with all that and so that's what i had and it was the best education because it what it gave a person heart feeling reality to our world is really smaller than we think and it just gave me so much compassion and gratitude. And I mean, some of these ladies actually, we adopted them into the family and, and later on, they, some of them stayed in my home until they passed away later in life. I mean, they were like my, grand, my extended grandparents. <laughs> they didn't have children, whatever, and they were with me. And so it was just a, a beautiful experience. And not everywhere in the US is that diverse, just, Los Angeles, California, we had that, that incredible diversity. So I felt like I got to travel the world. And then later I did travel for seven years full time and worked on things. So, so that's something that bringing your children these stories, um, parents listening in, or um, even young students in college to have living stories, living histories uh, of people that went through things or are currently, depending on where you are in the world, going through things that are so different from where in the United States where we live. Mm -hmm. Just have that changes the perspective yeah. entirely. It really can make a difference. Now, when you were a little girl, Golnoosh, what was your goal? Did you think you were going to get into this, this <laughs> and, and um, be an activist like this, or? Um, actually, no. I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that was my plan all throughout my childhood. Um, I, I decided I wanted to be a neurosurgeon when I was nine, wow. and um, and you know I came to the U.S. and I went to school. I went to high school. Um, Unfortunately, I was told when I was in high school, maybe fortunately now, but um, unfortunately I was told that, oh, as an immigrant, no, it's not really, it's too hard for you. You shouldn't, you shouldn't uh, pursue um, this degree. Um, of course, my, my English was quite weak at that point. I had just learned. Um, but but yeah so so that changed the direction of my life i was uh, you know that's really where i wanted to to go i still love surgeries i mm -hmm. have this very strange hobby of of watching videos of uh, there, there are universities that do live yeah. like they have videos on, on youtube of surgeries and, and i watch those i think those are fascinating um mm -hmm. and, and learn a little bit from uh, from what I'm seeing, but of course, um, I'm happy for where I ended up. Uh, definitely, uh, would have been a different life if I had become, mm -hmm. if I had gone into medicine, and um, and and but 
you know, still everything happens for a reason. You never know uh, what's what's in the in the box for the next 15, 20 years. But I'm definitely happy with where I am. And and you know what you said about the older ladies that is so important. The stories that's what really sits with you. Mm -hmm. So that's the one thing in my current day. That's the one thing that I just. I want, I, I like crave it. I want the stories of people. I want to hear more and more stories. And I think that at any time, and this is for kids, for adults, for anybody, when you see a person, I think we should be interested in their story. Not, yeah. not telling them about ourselves, but hearing yeah. their stories. And, yeah. and I love that. Sometimes, you know, in, in, our, in, a, in the park next to my house, I, I find these older people and I'm just, I sit there and ask them a couple of questions and let them tell me their stories because you can learn so much and you can pick up so much. Um, so it's really a valuable thing to have those stories and to appreciate the stories. And you don't take a hundred percent of it at home, but you may take some bits and pieces that come back um, to you later on as, um, and, and you may use it, you know, in 10 years, it may, it may come in handy. But the stories are really important. The stories of the people that I've met uh, overseas, they stay with me, they form what I write and the scholarship that I do and the stories I tell my students. Yes, yes, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Now, we, I wanted to get back to the equality um, with, with women. Mm -hmm. And I remember trying to go back to school to get another degree. Once I, I shut down, I had five gift stores for many years. And the, the thing that they told me, this was a big university <laughs> and they had a rule that the first year you have to live on campus. And by this point in my life, I had two babies at home that were, you know, three and five. Yeah. And so that was not an option. <laughs> and although it sounded very tempting. Yeah. And, and I literally remember writing a really long letter to the dean of the school about how this is why you only have 2% women in these courses because yeah. they during this age group, we have children. <laughs> so right. We tend to be the ones still that, that are the main caregivers, no matter what you do. And, and so it's just not going to happen. I and then I ended up going to another university, but that that was something. And they finally changed it. I think five or six years later, where they changed that program for women. And so maybe my letter, <laughs> so maybe. Write, letters, <laughs> write letters, get your voice out there. If it didn't work out, and I I still ended up running lots of businesses and doing lots of things and and getting three more degrees and all this stuff. So so it was fine. But it was I felt I needed to do that. So little things like a letter, I don't know if that helped or not, but they did change it over time. But it's just letting people know, hey, wait a minute. This isn't, this isn't, this is why you're, st you want to make more money in your university? Let the women in. Right. But understand, they may have children during this age group. Right. They may have other responsibilities. So, you know, it has to be accommodating for all. And that, that's going to make a big difference. So just like you, you know, co going to this country and they said, no, you can't do this neurosurgeon <laughs> deal. And right. I mean, no is usually the biggest yes. So you never know in the future, Golnoosh, you may do oh. that too. <laughs> when you're spared to <laughs> it may take many, many years. Um, <laughs> you know, sometimes you take a no and you make it into a, a bigger yes and something yes. else. So it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, what you, what you think originally, um, and um, it, it's life. Life is full of surprises as long as we're moving and making decisions and moving forward. The, yeah. the moment that there are no longer surprises are the moments when you stop making decisions and moving. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, there was this. I think it was an advertisement that said um, a body in, in movement or body in motion always stays in motion. I mean, that comes from science. Um, and I think that's true. That's true in everything we do, right? The moment you start moving, you're doing something, it will continue moving mm -hmm. as long as you're, you're, of course, contributing to it and you're not putting a force stop to it, right? Mm -hmm. When you're not responding to emails or you're, we're not um, acting on things that are coming on way, 
those are the stops. This is actually a forced stop. You know, when you get your mind to it, um, I don't know if you ever experienced this, but I sometimes get this, like an email comes in, I'm like, oh, okay, I will respond to it uh, tomorrow. Well, that's a stop. I'm actually putting energy and thinking about putting a stop into something that should be moving. So, so that I remind myself, no, you need to move things forward. So yeah. it's, it's important to stay in motion and stay active, no matter how many no's we hear, no matter what right. the no's are telling us. And sure, change the path a little bit, but just go forward. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Tony Robbins says you're either growing or you're dying. So, yeah. <laughs> so we have to keep growing, definitely. Yeah. Now we're coming to the end of our talking time. So I'd love for hear how people can connect with you and learn more about all you're doing. Um, of course, yes. So I am on um, Twitter and on YouTube and I have a LinkedIn account. So um, on YouTube, they can just search my name, Golnoush Hakim Dabar, and I come up. Uh, same thing on Twitter and same thing on, on LinkedIn. Um, I'm actually, no one in the world has my name. So if my name is typed into Google. That's the only person that comes up. So, um, so and I'll be happy to be connected and um, continue the conversation. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much, Golnoush. And for those tuning in, we'll be back after these messages. Thank you.